So I was a pastor in Australia before I felt, well, I already felt God was calling me to mission and did some years of training as pastoral work before going to Indonesia, working there in church planting and leadership development and theological education by extension. Those were my primary areas of ministry. But if you ask me what is my real part passion, it is to disciple and mentor younger people so that they fulfill their ministry uh, calling in God. That's what I love to do. And hopefully this session might help to encourage some of you in your calling for God. I have a question for you, which you do not have to un all answer now, but I want you to think about it for a minute before I go on. Some of you I have already talked to before we went on live and I've found out where you live, but I have this question for you. Uh, two questions and you don't have to answer them to me, but I want you to think about them. You can think, what am I doing now? What is the area of work or ministry I'm doing now? That's a simple question. But the more important question is, what do you feel is God's calling on your life? I'll repeat that. What do you feel is God's calling on your life? I want you to think about that just for about 30 seconds. Why do I ask that question? Because in my own life, that was a very important question. When I was a young person and going into theological college, I knew that my calling in life was to minister life to people. And I had a sense that it probably was cross-cultural. So although I went into pastoral ministry, I saw that as preparing me for what I sensed was God's calling that I should be a cross-cultural minister. Now, I had people in my church where I was considered to be doing a very effective job in Australia, saying, why are you leaving us? And I, my answer to them is, was, I am going to people who do not know about Jesus because you are here and you can share that good news with people in this local context. I'm not needed here as much as I'm needed somewhere else. So that's why that strong sense of calling has influenced all of my life. And that is why I'm asking that question of you, because I have a firm conviction that the Holy Spirit does put a calling on our lives as we are open to him. And I ask you to consider that constantly and keep asking God to guide and lead you in his ways. Yes, it's good to listen to men and to listen to the wise counsel of those around you, but hearing what God is saying to us is of critical importance. Now, today we are looking at the historical perspectives on mission. Now, that is about church history and its influence on the church. Now, for some of you, you would be very excited about that. But for others, perhaps, church history is not something that really excites you so much. But I want to suggest to you that we are looking at perspectives of history of the church. So we're trying to find some keys that will help us to learn from that in the situations we find ourselves in today. So that's what I would like us to do. So I'm going to flick over, if I can, if all goes well here, to this. Okay, so here we are. 
the historical perspectives of mission. Now, a lot of the material I'm sharing with you comes from a colleague of ours called Patrick Johnson. Now, Patrick Johnson, some, who knows who has heard of Patrick Johnson and uh, the book Operation World or Future of the Global Church? Now, I have a, one of his books right here. You can't see it, but this is the book that I'm talking about. Okay, Future of the Global Church. So some of the materials I'm using come from that, a lot of them actually, because he presented a lot of very good materials for us. So now if I can get this to go now, I might have to go back. Uh, as I expected, that didn't work quite as well as I would have liked. We'll try it one more time. Ah, now we're right. My daughter, who does a lot more Zooming teaching, said usually one in 20 times you'll run into a bit of a problem. So be ready for them. So I want to ask you, what was the primary motivation of mission expan expansion in the first century? You listened to Morris last week, I think, and I think, or two weeks ago, and I think that was helpful in giving a biblical basis for mission. Is that right? All of you did that? Yes. So I want to suggest to you that the first century, the expansion was the main reason was that our Lord Jesus himself emphasized to his disciples that they should be doing this ministry before he returned to heaven. So now, once again, it's, it's locked up again. Why does it do that? I'm not sure. I'll have to go. This Trevor, way. I think um, in, like when you um, turn the next slide, yes. uh, instead of just clicking the keyboard, just, yes. just click the mouse. I think um, okay. that, that might be ah, much. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to have a teacher of <laughs> Zoom to help me in this. Okay, so you last week, I think with Morris would have considered the verse in Acts 1 8, which says that wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and you will be filled with the Spirit and then you will be witnesses. So Jesus spoke his last command, his words to they were to believers, okay, people, particularly his disciples. And he said wait until the holy spirit fills you you see it's really important for anybody involved in missional work or any kingdom work to be filled with the spirit to know the power of the spirit human effort will not bring anyone into the kingdom it's a work of god and he works through us but it's the holy spirit that changes the hearts of men and women so Jesus said, you need to be filled with the Spirit, and then you need to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Now, you know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, and thousands of people, 3,000 people came to faith in one day, and they continued to minister there, and then they continued to minister in Judea. So in those two areas, for the next four or five years, they were fulfilling the Lord's command. But they didn't go any further, even though they'd been encouraged to. So they eventually went into Samaria. But why did they end up going into Samaria? Because of persecution. Peter was martyred, uh, Stephen was martyred, and the church was scattered by persecution. And I want to make a comment to you here. Very often, King Jesus has allowed persecution to occur in order to scatter the church to places they would not normally go. He does that even today. So they went to Samaria and then, of course, to the ends of the earth. 
but they were to be witnesses for him in all of those places. And that calling of Jesus, those last words were very important to his disciples. And I want to suggest to you that the last words of any person are important. If any of you have been with an aged grandmother or some other relative just before they died, they might have said some special things to you, and you will remember those. Now, I have the situation where when I was just 13 years of age, my father was knocked down by a driver who was drunk and he was critically injured. And I only had about 30 seconds, maybe one minute with him in a hospital before he died. He loved Jesus, passionate, helped plant a couple of churches. And he said some things to encourage me. And that was 60 years ago, but I still remember his encouragement to me. Now, the very last words of Jesus were crucially important. Jesus could have said many things to his disciples, but for him, the most important thing was that they would be his witnesses throughout the world. Now, I want to ask you a question at this time. Do those last words of Jesus seriously impact the way you think about your ministry today? That's an important question to think about. So let's see what the disciples did with that, uh, that last word of Jesus. Now, here is the picture of the Roman Empire in AD 114. You can see that area. But now I want to show you what the disciples did. All those yellow and brown areas are where the disciples did ministry. Peter and Paul and all of the others. A huge area, far beyond the Roman Empire. They were serious about being a follower of Jesus. For them, this was critical. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of these disciples of Jesus that you might not know. It comes from Fox's book, which is probably the most authentic book about the history of the early disciples. You know, Stephen was martyred in about AD 34. James, the son of Zebedee, we read about him in Acts, he was he was beheaded by Herod Agrippa in about AD 44. Then Philip, who was one of the apostles, he was crucified in Heliopolis in Phrygia, which is up in Upper Mesopotamia in AD 54. Matthew served in Ethiopia in Africa and then in Parthia, which is uh, on the, uh, in the map there, which is now Persia, and he was martyred there. James, the brother of Jesus, was beaten to death, aged 94. Matthias was uh, stoned to death and then beheaded. Andrew, the brother of Peter, preached in many Asian countries and was martyred in Edessa, Mesopotamia, and crucified. Mark, the gospel writer, uh, died in North Africa in Alexandria, pulled to pieces by an angry crowd. Peter was crucified upside down, AD 65. Paul beheaded in Rome in 67, 68. Jude called Thaddeus was crucified in Odessa in AD 72. Bartholomew, he translated the gospel into Indian languages, was beaten and crucified in India. Simon the Zealot preached in Mauritania in Northwest Africa in Britain, and he was crucified there in Britain in AD 74. The Apostle John was the only one who didn't die a martyr's death. These guys took it very seriously. They gave their lives for the gospel of Jesus. Now, that's a challenge for us. And I think it's something that we in the 21st century, when we're coming to serve God, don't always think about. So I want to just say that beyond the first century, the church began to change. Bishops were formed. They had church buildings. 
and the structure of the church became much stronger. Uh, and in some ways that seems good, but they lost that flexibility and that movement that the apostles had. And then by the third century, you can see here that there was incredible persecution of the church. Almost all of the church, the yellow areas of where the church was, almost all of the areas were under persecution. Can you see that on the map? An incredible difficulty in it. You will get, you can get these pictures later. Uh, these, this, this. So don't worry about taking in all the information. You can look at that. I want you just to get a view of what, a perspective of what was happening in the church. So there was still outreach going on. The church was growing into Persia, but it was under extreme persecution, a difficult time. But interestingly, it wasn't church leaders that helped in the advancement of the gospel, but it was ordinary Christians who just served Jesus and went out on their own initiative. Let me show you now some of the statistics of what happened in that century. There was about 192 million people in the world. The Christians at the beginning of the century were about 4.7 million. Now, you saw the picture back there of the, uh, the persecution, but look how many Christians there were in the 100 years. Over three times the number of Christians at the end of the century as there were at the beginning of the century. So in the midst of persecution, ordinary Christians, disciples of Jesus, brought many people into the kingdom. Now, and the number of Christians in the world grew three times. The number of Christian martyrs was nearly 400,000. And this last one, that means over one in 20 Christians died for their faith in that century. Can you imagine that? In your church, if you've got 300 people, that means how many are going to give, about 20 of them will be part of giving their lives for Jesus. That's a very big challenge for us today. So, I just think it's important for us to realize that ordinary Christians paid a great price for following Jesus. And they also were important in sharing the good news to people who didn't already know it. I just want to make a comment now about martyrdom generally. I'm not trying to be gloomy or bleak, but this is a reality of our church and of the church of Jesus. Martyrdom in Christian history has been very, very important. And it's not the same all the time. There have been early times in the early centuries, I mentioned some of them, where the Romans and the Persians in particular uh, persecuted the church. And then in the 13th and 14th century, I won't get to talk much about that later, uh, the Mongols and the Muslims particularly killed millions of Christians. And then in the 20th century, the most Christians have, have been killed by Marxists, either in China or in, in the Soviet Union. Now, I want you to notice this other point, which I have not really read when I was doing church history. Orthodox Christians comprise over 60% of the 70 million people who've been martyred in church history. In other words, more Orthodox Christians have been killed than any other denomination by a long, long way. And most martyrs, most people who've died for their faith in Jesus have done so in the last century. If you add all the other centuries up, they don't come near what happened in the last century. So while the last century was a time of great growth for the church and for the kingdom of God, it was also a time of great suffering and martyrdom. Now, if you know your church history, you'll know that something very dramatic happened in the fourth century. The emperor of the Roman Empire, Constantine, for some reason we're not altogether clear on, became a Christian or said he was a follower of Jesus. We're not exactly sure what that meant for him, but it made a big difference. Instead of 
the Christians now being persecuted terribly by the Romans, they became a more accepted group. But there was a very unhelpful thing that happened. The church became linked in a, in a way with the state government. They were accepted. And as a result, they started to have a powerful influence through and with the state government. And so the church, instead of being a missional movement, became locked into the power, political power structures. And that affected the church for century upon century and still does even in some places today. Do you know that even in Germany today, if I'm not mistaken, it was this way about 15 years ago, Lutheran pastors are paid by the state. They're paid by the state. So this shows how this state government thing still affects us even in the 21st century. So this created a big problem for missions because the church then became involved in trying to establish itself, gaining power with government, and its focus changed. Instead of being missional and, and on the run, as it were, it now became solid and concerned about leadership and government and power. This was a major problem for missions. And one of the sad things that happened was the Ephesians 4 ministries. Let me, do you remember what it says in Ephesians 4? It says that God gave to the church five ministries so that the whole church would be built up. And they were apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. Now, in the early church, the apostles and prophets and evangelists were very, very dominant. But by the fourth century, all of those ministries virtually were gone. They were no longer significant because the church was more concerned with power and its own leadership and, and protecting itself. And so missions, as a result, was badly affected. So now I want you to think about this. This is an outbreak group. We're going to break into a few groups now. In the light of the insights we've read about this early part of the church and the challenges the Christian church experienced in the early centuries, what insights have you gained that might help you minister in your own cultural context today? And the second question is about, as we can see that the church grew significantly in spite of persecution, how are you or how can you prepare your people for suffering? Because we probably will. In fact, Paul said, if we live a godly life, we will suffer persecution. And Jesus said the same. And then the last question might be more difficult for you. These Ephesians 4 ministries. Do you see in your church people who were evangelists, people who are got a, a prophetic ministry, uh, people who lay people being released into ministry? That's, that's a question that I ask you because those are the issues that impact missional vision. So I want you to go into breakout groups. That, that question will be up there. And to think maybe you'll only talk about one of those things. Maybe the first one. It doesn't matter, but I want you to be saying, well, I've been listening to things. What does that mean for the context in which I find myself now? Okay, we well, do that in breakout groups. Jeff will put you into a breakout group now for you to think about for five, seven minutes. Just a minute. I, um, yeah. I'm what I'll do. Around the group. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you know.
So that's it. So which group are you in? You have to click OK. Yeah. They? Yeah. I think I, I already assigned you. OK. Yeah. So, you can see the Okay, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. Okay, I hope that was helpful. In our little group, we talked a lot about the martyrdom issue and the cost of being a follower of Jesus. And in some of our contexts, that is a very real issue, but it's something we need to think about. I mean, obviously those early disciples, they had walked with Jesus, they'd lived with him, they'd seen him suffer and die for them, risen from the dead, everything, every, anything that was significant for them, they were willing to put aside for the kingdom. Okay, so let's go back to our, our notes and hopefully they work this time. Um, during, during, the, um, during the Middle Ages or the Early Ages, there, I told you that the church became I'd say static and concerned with power and control and became a little bit corrupt. But there were two missionary movements that are two of my favorites in all of history. And I want to talk about them a little bit with you. You might not know much about them. The Celtic movement. Now, often when we think of Celtic, we think of Catholic, but actually the Celtic movement uh, it depends on the history books you read, of course, but the Celtic movement was not really under the Catholic Church. It was, they had fellowship with it, but in the early days, the Celtic movement was quite a different movement. And it had a profound effect in our world. Some people say that the Celts saved Europe because of their missionary zeal in the fourth and fifth century, fifth century, particularly in sixth they started to reach out to the German and other people in Europe who were pagans and brought them to Jesus. So the Celtic movement was really powerful. And if you read your church history, I'd like you to read another time about Patrick, who was called the patron saint of, of Ireland. Now, I'll tell you a bit about his story because it, I think it encourages us about our own personal journey with Jesus. Now, Patrick was from England, but when he was 16 years of age, he was from a fairly well-to-do family, he was kidnapped by Irish pirates and taken to Ireland as a slave. And he was a slave there for six years. And then after six years, somehow or other, he escaped and got in a boat and went back to England. And uh, he started to study and whatever else. He, his people were followers of Jesus. But then after some years, he felt called and challenged of God to go to Ireland as a missionary. The very people that kidnapped him, he felt God was saying, you go to these people None of them are Christians there. There was no Christian faith in Ireland. They were Druids, who were a kind of a, a, a Gnostic uh, religious group. And Patrick, what an amazing thing. Can you imagine doing that, being a slave to some people, escaping, but then feeling the call of God to go back? I like this story because I think it can challenge us today. We might be in situations which we think are terrible, but God might be calling us back into those situations 
for his namesake. So Patrick went back and he became an amazing missionary and evangelist for God. Amazing. He confronted, there's a picture there of another one who did the same thing. And what you see of Boniface there, all the people around him really angry. And Patrick did the same with Druid leaders. Hundreds of people would come around him and he would fearlessly proclaim Jesus and say, my Jesus is stronger than the powers you believe in. And he chopped down one of their big sacred trees that they used to worship at. And they were incensed. He said, well, look, if the, the gods that you worship here are real, they will kill me. You shouldn't try and kill me. And of course, he wasn't killed. And eventually, the power of his witness led many leaders to Christ. And eventually, the whole of Ireland, over time, became Christian and followed Jesus. An astounding story. Boniface and Brendan, these other people here in different parts, they also were profoundly committed to Jesus. They risked their lives for Jesus, just like those early disciples. I think it's a powerful story. And I just want to show you the Celtic Church reached out to Ireland through Patrick, and you can see that area there. But then they reached out both into Scotland there and then right into Europe. They sent missionaries, they set up monastic centers, and they learned languages. They were culturally sensitive. And over time, they led all of the many, many of these people to Jesus. I just want to show you something of the way of Celtic evangelism. I think there are many things that the Celts do that we can learn from. They were culturally relevant. That means they saw the cultures they were in and they adjusted to them. Where they were able to, and they used local language, so they spent a lot of time learning local languages so that they did not communicate in, in Greek or, or Latin or some language that the people didn't really know well. They used local poetry. My goodness. I, I used to work in Indonesia and uh, I certainly learned the language well and uh, I liked their music, but I never really got a handle on their poetry. So to learn poetry, you really have to know the culture well. So here we have this group of people when the church was getting controlled by power and working with state governments, they were going out to the people that they wanted to reach and adjusting to them, learning their language, using poetry, using their local music. Those of you that live in Asian cultures or African cultures, if you hear the music of your culture, you know, rather than an English hymn or something, it stirs your heart, okay? Uh, so, you know, I mean, I've been in Africa and, and, and when I hear African worship, my goodness me, it's very different from Australian worship. And it's beautiful. Uh, but for Africans, I think coming to Australia, they would think it's rather dull. So here we have, here we have these uh, Asians. Um, oh dear, I've got a phone call. Um, I, they, they really adjusted. And they were ecologically sensitive. They, they built farms. They, they were careful. They were probably the best, um, best ones who realized that looking after the earth was a part of their calling in life. Okay? They realized that. They believed in that. And they were excellent disciples. When a person started moving towards Jesus, they got alongside them. And they helped them to grow in Jesus. That is something that I hope you learn about. We will talk more about that in a few weeks' time when we have another lesson. And they were great on prayer. They were great on prayer, and missions was their vision. The Celts had many of their places, uh, monasteries and places of um, living, destroyed by the Vikings, but they kept building them again. Some of their places were destroyed 10 times, and they kept rebuilding them and going out on mission. Isn't that amazing? I think 
after two times, I'd be thinking, I've had enough of this. But these people were passionate for Jesus. And it, it cost many of them their lives, but they were faithful for Jesus. So if you want to learn about a, a, an older mission movement, the Celts are a wonderful group to talk about. In our second session, I'm going to talk about modern missions, but I really wanted to talk about missions that you possibly haven't heard so much about. So the Celts were one of those. The other one that I wanted to talk about was called the Church of the East. Now, uh, I'll take a bit of time. This is different from the Eastern Church. If you've read church history, the Eastern Church uh, was um, churches in Syria, the Syriac Church, the Coptic Church, uh, and, and the Armenian Church. But the Eastern Church, the Church of the East, was different. It was in Persia, basically in Persia. Now, it's often called the Nestorian Church. And I'm only talking about this because I think it's important for us. There's a, some principles I want to share with you. Oh, we're nearly out of time. So this church, see where they reached to. They were here, they were in Persia, you know where Persia is, uh, but they reached right across to China. Amazing. They, and in, what I like about this map is they, that that church started in the second century, but in the sixth and seventh century, the place where the church originated was under great persecution. See where the brown areas are? But in spite of that, they kept going out, natural lay people going out, sharing the good news all the way across Asia. It's said that by about six or 700 AD, 25% of Central Asia was Christian. Did you hear that? 25% of Central Asia was Christian. Astounding ministry of the Church of the East, which is often called the Nestorian Church. I would like to talk more about that, but I can't because we're almost out of time. So this is a really powerful position of our church. And you can see here what happened in the next century. Islam came in, all kinds of challenges hit the church. But you see, even over there in the yellow, those churches still survived. That was the Church of the East. These missionaries that went out, no, no link back with their home church at all, they established their own entity in foreign lands and they continued there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Isn't that astounding? Wouldn't you like to be part of a ministry for King Jesus that reached other people for him for hundreds and hundreds of years. We're almost out of time, aren't we? But I just want to show one last picture to you. Um, just this is a picture of the centuries. And uh, I hope it just gives you a broad idea. You see here in the early church, there was a sudden growth of the church up until about the fifth century. And then what happened? As I said, it became politicized. It got influenced by state government and was more concerned with its own power than the influence of Islam you can see in the 8th century. The Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, the church that, and, and some of the churches that I've been talking about, they started to have an impact through Asia. And then you see the decline again about 1400. Three things happened there. The Black Death, it killed half of the people in, in, in Europe, uh, around about half the people, 30 to 50% of people died in Europe. And that's why there was a drop in the population. But also the Mongolian slaughter of Christians and Islam was also very fierce again at that time. Just about the Mongolians, they say that when the Mongol hordes started slaughtering, they reckon they killed 40 million people about 11% of the world's population. Astounding. So this was a terribly dark time. And so well, what we see here for about 400 years, the church really didn't grow. And in the next session, we'll talk about 
how God and his grace helped it to grow again. Okay? Time for a break, isn't it? Okay, so um, it's now uh, seven to three. So why don't we just come back in about seven minutes, just have a short toilet break and we'll be starting at three, uh, 3 p.m. sharp, right? So I'll see you at three in about seven minutes. Thank you. Right. About how what I'm, uh, the, after Constantine, the church became too linked with the state. Do you know what I mean by that? With the political powers. Uh, and as a result of that, that really badly influenced the church. The church has usually been most effective when it's on the fringe of the, of the world, when it's not well received. Patrick Johnson did some research that every time there's been profound renewal that's touched a culture, the church has not been well received before that happened. So when you're in a place of acceptance, and uh, often that's not the best time for the church to show how strong it is. We need to show light in the darkness. And sometimes God puts us in a dark place so that our light shines stronger. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to mention about all of the... Oh, dear. My phone's going off again. I'll have to turn it off. Uh, pardon me. The problem of having, uh, a, I didn't have my phone turned off. Sorry about that. Um, the, you've all will have read in your studies about all the different councils that were run by the church, the Council of Ephesus, the Council of Chalcedon, and so on. One of the problems with those councils, uh, when I read theology, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, they were trying to sort out some theological principles to help us. And that's what we focused on. But the impact of those particular councils on the church as a whole group was disastrous. Why do I say that? Because the people that didn't agree with one group were excommunicated. And so for century upon century, those parts of the church have been divided. Now, what does John 17 tell us about the prayer of Jesus? Lord, I pray that they'll be one, even as we are one. And there is a sense in which you might say, oh, yeah, but they had some theological differences. Well, some of those differences were very, very small, and they were about deep issues that even now we have a different view about. Uh, so what happened is that the church became divided and did not have a united voice in our world. The biggest challenge the church has today is the problem of unity. And I want to suggest to you that in your sphere of influence, that you remember this, that Jesus is glorified when his church is seen to be in unity. The Father, Son, and Spirit are in unity, and God wants his church as much as it can to be in unity. Yes, there are theological issues that do divide us. Some of those things are very serious, but most of them are more minor issues. We have a different view about baptism. We have a different view about how we do communion. These are minor issues. They're not seriously big issues. Don't let minor things keep you from unity with other people. Uh, we read in the Bible, if you don't love your brother whom you've seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Do you have an attitude of love towards people? If we can agree to disagree, but still be in unity with each other. That was a big problem in the Middle, East, Middle Ages, and it still is a huge problem today. The other problem I want to mention is that the church you know, on the day of Pentecost, what was the most extraordinary thing that happened? The, the apostles, what did they speak in? The languages of all the people around them. That is what attracted people. How can he speak? How can he speak Farsi? How is he speaking? How is he speaking Arabic? How is he? 
they were given this miraculous ability to speak in other languages and that drew people. But for the next couple of centuries, the ministry they did was not in the local tongue. They spoke Latin, they spoke Greek, or they spoke Aramaic. And the churches they planted were planted with that language. And that is one of the reasons why Islam swept the church away in Palestine and North Africa, because those churches were not grounded in a local language. Every place where the church, like in Armenia and so on, where and in, 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 uh, in Persia, where the church was actually used the local language, it survived much more effectively. So my point to you is, when we're involved in mi missional ministry, use local language. Use the heart language of people. Church history tells us, that's why we need to study church history, that when we do that, we're likely to be far more effective and also have a more lasting legacy. Okay? Let's move to the next part of our session, if I can get it up and get... We're still on that one, but we'll, let's just move on. This is session two. It's perspectives on the history of the modern era of missions. So... The lessons we learn from the thousand years of static missional activity, there was a general lack of vitality in the church. Yes, they were suffering from severe persecution. But in the second, in the third century, they all did, but they still grew, remember. But it was this close relationship between church leaders and political power that became a problem. And the main missional influences were outside of the mainstream church structure and often persecuted. That's a very sad thing, but that's what happened. So here's another picture of um, the church. We see there the start, there was growth through fervent witness of the persecuted early church in those early centuries that we've talked about. Then you can see the Caucasian oh, and then we've also got the non-Caucasian Christians. You can see for, there was a, this is where the Eastern church was so strong. You can see there in the sixth, seventh, seventh centuries that they were very strong, but then under persecution dropped. And then, then you can see, see, notice that by about 1900, that the Caucasian church compared to the majority world church starts to decline. Do you see that? That's the growth. And we're going to talk about that growth over the next few minutes. There was a massive growth in the majority world church. I'm hoping I can talk to you about this. I need a few more hours to do it, but we only have a few minutes. So please forgive me if I do not touch some things that you think are important. I've just written down a couple of points that I think are really important as to why there was this amazing growth in the missionary movements in the modern era. First and foremost, it's because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always wanting to bring people to, 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 to know Jesus. And we can't do anything without his ministry. But there were other factors that the Holy Spirit used. The translation and the printing of the scriptures was absolutely vital. And it enabled an ordinary people to study God's word. Before that, they had to listen to the priest speak on a Sunday or whenever. And they didn't study the word and they only heard what he had to say. But when Wycliffe uh, and Tyndale and these men translated the Bible, it was transforming. Wycliffe in the 14th century translated the Bible first into English and they wanted to kill him for it. Uh, he died before they got to kill him. But John Huss and others who had this same idea of renewal, they died at the stake because the church wanted to have control power and didn't want any voices that didn't agree with them. And that's because there was this disillusionment. You know that word? People were disillusioned 
with a corrupt and compromised church. They could see that the church was more about its power and wealth rather than on reaching out to people who needed to know about Jesus. Now, another reason why, and we're going to look at this in a moment further, there were concerted prayer movements with a deep devotion to Jesus. People started praying earnestly for God to work. And more flexible ministry models outside of the main structure of the church began to develop. These were some of the reasons, I believe, why there was this profound missionary movement. Now, I want to just, let's look at some of these. I just want to, Patrick Johnson did some study about revival, revivals right through all of history. He did a lot of study. And he found this linkage, this connection between prayer and revivals. If you look at this picture, I hope these pictures help you. You can see that where there has been a, a prayer movement, not too long after it, you see revival or an awakening going on. And that's really quite significant. And I want you to think about that in terms of your own ministry. In my ministry, as a, in my whole journey with Jesus, prayer has been incredibly important. And I think of the times when in the church, when I, before, when I was in Australia, we used to have, there was a real vibrant work of God going amongst youth. And we used to meet uh, early every morning for prayer. And then people would have breakfast at the church and go off to work. Uh, and it was a time of profound growth. And the same in Indonesia, uh, prayer, and uh, we saw a move of God there. And I believe it's, it is critical for us. We, you are all doing postgraduate study. And it's helpful to gain knowledge. But brothers and sisters, knowing Jesus, being devoted to him, and giving yourself to prayer in his name is one of the most critical things you can do for effective ministry. You'll hear from God and God will move because God desires people to pray and to seek his face so that he can bring these revivals and let's look at some of them. The one I want to talk about, I don't know whether you know about the Moravian ministry. They are one of my favorite ministries as well. I actually have a, a Moravian star in, my, my, in the room I'm in with you. I don't think I can show it to you. I'd like to. It just reminds me of this movement. But I, th there are just a couple of points I have about it here. Do you know it was begun by religious refugees? I think that's fascinating. We live in a world of refugees today. And why were they religious refugees? Because of what I was just saying before. The Catholic Church was persecuting people who didn't follow their way. And all over the Europe in those days, uh, people who held different views were, in, were being persecuted. And eventually they were able, they, were, they found, found, they had a safe place to meet, a place called Hernhut, which is now in Czechoslovakia. And Count Zinzendorf was the man who made that place available. But the problem was these re religious refugees came from every kind of uh, Christian persuasion. There were people who were Marav uh, 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 brethren who had a, a view of, of Christ that was different from the people who came from a more catholic -y influenced background. They were all different. And at first, they were very excited to have a safe place. But when they started talking, they had different views about things, and they started to have divisions. And, and this was a very distressing thing. But eventually, so isn't it interesting? When, when we're in a critical situation, we put our minor things apart, aside and we, 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 we feel safe just because we're together. But after a while, the little differences between us can become very significant. Praise God, by the grace of God, on the 13th of August, 1727, 
these people were having the differences and they had a communion meeting because they were committed to unity, but they were not doing it well. And in that communion meeting, the Holy Spirit came down and transformed them. That's all I can say. They were a different group that left that meeting than the group that started it. And as a result of that, they began what's called the Moravian Missionary Movement. And they started a prayer meeting 24-7. And I mean 24-7. There were people praying every hour from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. Then another group, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. They prayed 24-7 for how long? Do you know? 103 years. A constant prayer movement by the Moravians for 103 years. Isn't that astounding? And what did they pray about? Not just for themselves. They were totally committed and devoted to Jesus. They were just so thankful that they knew that Jesus had saved them and they wanted other people to know about that. So they started sending out missionaries. All they did was teach them a trade, didn't give them any money, and they sent them out. Uh, and about one in every 40 persons in the Moravian church mission movement went out as missionaries. Over 2,000 missionaries were sent out by the Moravians. And I'll show you a picture of where they went in a moment. And they influenced a whole lot of people. They actually, I believe, influenced the modern missionary movement with William Carey, John Wesley, went to a meeting of Moravians in London and that's where he was touched by, by God and by the Holy Spirit and was, became a different person. And he led the great awakening that touched England and saved England from catastrophe. And he and Finney went also into USA. England and USA were touched in a great awakening. So let's, this is where this is where this Moravian group of refugees ended up going. Can you see how strong their missional vision was? You saw the picture of the thousand years where there was basically no, after the Nestorian or the Eastern Church, the Church of the East or and the Celts for about 600 years, there was really no significant mission movement. But here we see what the Moravians did. They went to all of these places and I want to tell you particularly about them going to the West Indies. This is a very challenging story. This shows how devoted they were to Jesus. They wanted these slaves in the West Indies to have a chance to hear about Jesus. But there was a problem. The only way they could go there was to go as a slave. So some of them sold themselves into slavery in order to go to the West Indies. Can you imagine that? And when they left at Amsterdam to go on the boat, the Moravians were there praying for them, weeping for them, as these people willingly sold themselves into slavery in order to be a servant of Jesus to the West Indies. This happened in the 18th century. And this was a powerful, in my view, an incredibly powerful example that was that influenced the great awakening that happened later on with William Carey. I'd love to talk more about that, but I can't. So here's William Carey, who's often referred to as the, the uh, pioneer of modern missions. Again, he, in his church, he tried to encourage people about reaching out to those who didn't know about him. And do you know what the people in his church said? They said, Carrie, if God wants to save the heathen, he will do it without your help. That was the mindset of many people in Europe. They did not sense that they had this responsibility to be a disciple of Jesus and a witness for him. They did not take seriously the last words of Jesus. But William Carey did. And eventually, through him and his challenge, the Baptist missionary movement was formed and he went to India and became an incredible... He was a bootmaker by trade, 
but he obviously is incredibly gifted and skillful. He translated the scriptures into, I guess it was Hindi, he did it in a number of Indian languages, uh, an amazing man of God. Uh, we know that the church had already gone to India in the first century through Thomas and I think it was Bartholomew. Two of them went there and the church in Kerala, particularly around that area, Sunil would know more about this than me. He can tell you about that in a private conversation. Uh, but this was a profound move of God, which started something. It started a movement. And this is where this movement went, to all of these places. All of a sudden, people started moving. See the Kasi Hills there, and even in northwest India, in the Pacific Islands, Tonga, East Indies. Let me just say that colonialism was a huge problem. It was a doorway in a way, but also a huge problem. I'm going to have a short time here. Colonialism provided an opportunity for the gospel to go to countries because the colonialists were there, but it also created a difficulty, which we'll come to a bit later. So here we have the East Indies. Missionaries were not allowed. The Dutch wouldn't allow missionaries to go there for centuries because they wanted just to exploit the people of Indonesia. But eventually missionaries went there and there's been a move of God in all those places where they went. So here we see what happens when they and when people sense that the calling of God on them is to be a witness, even at cost. And this is what began that great awakening. Now, I want to show you the impact of this over the centuries. The, here we have a, a map of where Protestants were in 1792 when, uh, when Carey went to India. You can see the yellow areas where that's where there were Christians. So here we have 1800 years, almost 1800 years after Jesus, and this is the, the area where Protestant Christians were, were influential. There's something wrong with the church when it's only been able to do such a limited amount of work in 1800 years. But you can see after this mission advance that they started moving out from, from the places where they were. Let's see what happened. By 1910, look, see, that's where we are. But within about 50 years, a huge change is going on. Areas becoming, becoming, coming to faith, coming to faith, and the brown areas where we're starting to reach out again into China, uh, into uh, Myanmar and uh, other countries there, and in, 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 in uh, India and Pakistan, huge areas coming on and, and back uh, up into Europe as well. So this is, a, this is the result of people sensing a missional call and moving out in obedience to the call of Jesus. And many people died. Many people died. In our organization, WEC, when people went to the Congo in the heart of Africa, they took wood for their coffin in their luggage because usually one out of two people died of fever there in the first 12 months. That was the normal thing going on in those days. So those people, that's only 100 years ago, a bit over 100 years ago, people were willing to lay down their lives for the King of Kings. And here, look at this picture now. What's happening here by 1966? An amazing transformation going on as the gospel of Jesus starts to impact people and not institutional church, but ordinary Christians sharing their faith and mission movements without much money and without much expertise, being faithful to Jesus, touching people, helping the gospel of the kingdom to reach out. But of course, you can see what we call the 1040 window. Still a huge challenge, even till today. Even till today. 
Now, I just want to particularly look at Africa. We've got a number of our people from Africa here. Um, when we talk about evangelical, we're talking about people who have a high view of the scriptures, believe it's the inspired word of God. Jen, Jen, inspired word of God, and who believe that Jesus is the sole way we can get, we, we come to, to be saved, and that we need to have personal faith in him, and we need to be obedient to him. So those are what, it doesn't matter whether they're an evangelical church or not, it's people that believe like this. Now you can see in 1900 in Africa that the, the areas where there was a serious faith in Jesus was very small, okay? Very small indeed. But by 1960, there's a great change. Now I want to just go back to this. Something happened, which was a wonderful thing, I think, in mission history, which you might know about. In around about the 1900s, mission groups as a whole were so concerned about Islam in the north of Africa, they said, we need to build a belt of Christian ministry right across Africa, basically uh, through the, uh, the, uh, around the equator, so that we stop the advance of Islam and we start to move down and also then push back north for the, uh, to, for, for the sake of Jesus. Uh, and that's what they did. You can start to see it happening here, where Uganda and Nigeria and these countries and Congo and Rwanda start to be influenced. And they were, it was very difficult. Many people died doing that. But then by 2000, there was this huge shift. And it's one of the reasons I believe that shift occurred was the end of colonialization. It was a tremendously significant thing. When we look at church growth today, we say that the most church growth has occurred since about 1960. Interestingly, about the time colonialism went away. Colonialism enabled the church to get footholds in many countries, but there was a negative view of the gospel because it was linked to the colonialists who were not very Christian. So when colonialism went, the gospel was no longer necessarily foreign, but it, it could be looked at in its own right. This is the, I'm giving a very simple definition here. And so the, I know that from 1960 till uh, about now, there's more than twice as many Christians in Africa as there was in 1960. More than double the number of Christians in Africa. Amazing shift in Africa. And I just want to use that to show what happens when people are willing to be faithful to Jesus, to be his witness as he's asked them to be. I'm running out of time. So let's just look at a few other things. The, the growth of the, of the West and the, what I call the majority world. Here you can see the Europeans or the Caucasians, they've grown a little, but not much. But from 1980, see this amazing growth of people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. An astounding growth. Another picture of it is like this. In 1960, there were only 26 million people in the majority world, roughly, who, who were evangelicals. By 2000, an amazing growth, more than tenfold. And it's projected by 2040, it'll be huge again. This is, you are living in the most exciting age of the church ever. 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 Why do I say that? Because the kingdom is reaching people all over the world in difficult places. And God wants you and me to partner with him in this. So here's the total missionary uh, movement. You can see that exponential growth of missionaries getting this call of God in our world and going out. We know Korea is the second largest mission church in the world today and uh, mission sending church in the world today. Uh, and it's an amazing growth. Uh, Jeff himself is, a, is, a, is a, an expression of that. 
So here again, we see this movement of the church. The West was the dominant part of the church, but now the majority world is 70% of it. So you are in the majority and we are in the minority. We need you desperately to be faithful to Jesus as we are. These are broad pictures from about 15 years ago, and they only tell part of the story. We really don't know how many people, there's about 33% Christian, we know that's still accurate. How many are evangelized and how many are unevangelized is difficult to know. Roughly, it's probably about 20% that are totally unevangelized, but it's difficult to know. But the interesting thing is, these were 15 years ago, this is slightly different, but the majority of missionaries still go to the Christian world where there is more than 2% Christian. The majority of Christians still go there. And that 17 or maybe 15% go to the evangelized areas. And it might be up to 5% now that go to those who have less than 2% Christian. That, this is a problem. This is not what the Celts did. This is not what the Eastern Church did. This is not what the Moravians did. This is not what, uh, what, what the, the missionaries in the Great Awakening did. They went at great cost. But somehow, in the 21st century, we find even missionaries going to areas that are safer. I want to put a challenge to you, uh, that as you influence people in your country about the, the, the need for us to be bold witnesses for Jesus, that it's not just a matter of going, but going to places that are tough. I'll probably talk more about that in my other lecture in a, a little time because I'm running out of time now. But this, is, this verse has been a key verse for me all my life. I learned this from my dad and, uh, and I lost him at 13 years of age, but God has keeps bringing me, I'm 74 years of age now, okay? This still is a passionate part of my life. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every ethnic group and the end will come. God is calling us to reach every ethnic group. And there are huge numbers. Here are some of the numbers from uh, and Nepal. has also got huge numbers of unreached peoples, even though the church there is growing exponentially. But you can see huge numbers of people who are unreached. Uh, we need, God is calling us to be a part of this ministry to these people. We live in a season of un, the, the of greatest move, missionary movement ever. But God wants us to do some of the tough work that still needs to be done. The places that are not reached are not reached because they are the toughest. They are very difficult. I'm showing you one of those groups, which is the way in China, 10 million the Muslim peoples uh, influenced by the Arab traders back in the 15th century and hardly any people working amongst them. We, our organization has got a team up there. Uh, and But 10 million of them, very few churches, if just very small churches amongst the way, which we can't talk about. So what I want to finish with is... We can praise God for what he's done in this time of global harvest. 40 years, there have been conferences that have been very helpful. It's the greatest harvest the kingdom has ever seen. Almost every country now has an evangelical witness. Even Saudi Arabia, where you're not allowed to have a church meeting of any kind publicly, there are thousands of believers in Saudi. You won't get any stats on that officially. I've seen meetings of hundreds of uh, Saudis worshipping God. So God is at work even in these countries which officially don't have any Christians in them. God is at work. The 1990s have seen a breakthrough in religious systems. Iran, when the Ayatollah came to power in 1979, it was estimated there were about 4,000 Muslim background believers, that means people who'd come to faith out of Islam in, in, in Iran. Today, 
there are hundreds of thousands in the country who are followers of Jesus. We know that. And there are a million in the diaspora overseas of, of, uh, of people from Iran who are following Jesus. There are churches of, of, of them all over the place. God has done an astounding work. Uh, he's breaking through, even in tough and uh, seemingly impossible situations. But there is still a lot to be done. Many groups are still unreached because they're difficult to reach. The ministry to these groups can often be slow and very costly. Can I just tell you a story about one of these? North Africa has been really, really tough. And there was one family that felt called to Algeria. They're called the Marsh family. They've written a number of books about Islam. And uh, Charles Marsh went there and he served there, I think, for about 30 years and did not see one convert that he was aware of. I think it was his daughter or his son followed him and served there for decades as well and saw i think nine people that they know of become followers of jesus and they were all killed all martyred how devastating They're his grandchildren charles marsh's grandchildren followed through and started ministering there amongst the berbers and god began a movement which is profound amongst the, the berbers till today there's probably well over 100,000 Berber Christians in, in Algeria today. This is the place, oh, no, I better not say. Yeah, Raven Lowell ministered there in the 15th century uh, in this very same area to the Berbers and gave his life for the gospel there. I want to suggest to you that in your ministry, whether you see fruit or not, if we are faithful to the call of God, I believe this passionately, if you are faithful to the call of God, he will produce fruit. You might not see it, but he will do it. I want you to believe that. That's held me strong through times of great difficulty. When adverse circumstances come, I know the King Jesus will fulfill his promise to bring people from every tribe, tongue and nation to worship the Lamb. So, whether it's in your time or not, if God calls you to a people group, be faithful. Or if you're sending people from your church, be faithful in sending them. Don't look for quick results. The quick results only happen in areas where the church is already strong. In the, where there is no church, it is always tough going. It takes time and often it's costly for the planting of the seed in places where the kingdom has not yet been planted. What I think about as I close is I think of the world. And you know, in, in, when Jesus talked about the revelation, he talked about the lamps for the seven churches. And I like this idea of light. Let your light, and of course in John 5, and Matthew 5, let your light so, so shine that people may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Now, what, what am I saying? I think of the world and I think of everywhere where Christians go. The kingdom of God is there like a little candle. And when God looks at that, he sees these little candles everywhere. And those candles will not be snuffed out. The kingdom of God will grow by the spirit of God. I believe that passionately. And I believe God is calling us to faithful commitment to prayer that he will do this. This is a prayer of Jesus, which is for you whether you have a missional call or not. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That is something you and I should do every day. Whether we are part of the going, we should be praying that God will do by his spirit the sending of people so that this amazing missionary movement that you and I are able to witness around the world will continue to touch those areas which have not yet heard the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you.